be mindful of this, that the, the struggle for abolition began as soon as slavery was established in the New World. Since the founding of America, you have had people of African descent who have looked at their condition and have been dissatisfied with it. If we focus on Virginia and its tobacco culture, we realize that slave labor was the thing that made the tobacco culture emerge. Slave labor is the thing that enabled Virginia to survive. So if it were not for these people of African descent who were toiling in these tobacco fields, one could make the argument that America might not have succeeded. Dr. LaRotha Williams, Jr. I'm Assistant Professor of History at Tennessee State University. I was invited by Serena Gilbert to participate in the Created Equal series. Um, my part of the series was a discussion of the video, The Abolitionist. In it, we explored the origins of the abolitionist movement, their triumphs, and their failures. The underlying theme of the video was the quest for equality. Um, we talked about some of the major players of the abolitionist movement, such as Angelina Grimke, Frederick Douglass, John Brown, and others. Was equality even possible? And if so, how? When you consider what I have to talk to you today, about in terms of abolition, you'll see that, you know, if you listen to me carefully, you'll see that three things quickly emerge as possible sources for abolition. First and foremost, you could do it peacefully. You could try to work within the framework of the government. Second thing, you could utilize any means necessary obtain your freedom. So hence when we look at Gabriel Prosser and, 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 and Denmark Vesey and later on Nat Turner, we'll see that violence is a viable option. And third, it's the idea that the differences between blacks and whites were irreconcilable. So the only viable option would be for African Americans to leave and to go someplace else. As we go on and look at the American Revolution, and we listen intently to the revolutionary rhetoric, all men are created equal, something that Thomas Jefferson penned in the Declaration of Independence. But he wrote that while having more than 200 slaves at his home in Monticello, how do we reconcile that, or do we even try to reconcile that? Once America achieved its independence, our government is created with our Constitution. It is a document that created a republic, a, a government that was framed by and for the people. But nevertheless, nevertheless, it was a document that, protect, that protected the slave trade and the institution of slavery, despite never specifically naming slavery in the document. African Americans were not immune or insulated from that revolutionary rhetoric. As a matter of fact, during the days, the early days of the Republic, you have men like Benjamin Banneker and James Fortin and others who challenged the founders to reconcile what they were saying with what they actually observed, what they were actually doing. The video focuses on the abolitionist movement by drawing your attention to four exceptional Americans. William Lloyd Garrison, Angelina Grimke, Frederick Douglass, and Harriet Beecher Stowe. Actually, five Americans, John Brown. 
It is important to understand several things about the movement they led and the conditions under which it came into being. Remember this, slavery existed in each of the 13 colonies during the colonial period. Every single one. The only one that was created without slavery was Georgia. But about 10 years in, they underwent a conversion. It was not until the revolutionary period that we see voices open up, openly protesting the institution. One English writer made a very astute observation. He asked, and I quote, how is it that we hear the loudest yelps for liberty among the drivers of Negroes, end quote. It's during the colonial period that the strategies employed by Garrison and other abolitionists were conceptualized and put into action. One was the argument that slavery was evil. You know, I, I mentioned in my earlier remarks that equality was one of the main themes of this series. Well, um, if you pay attention to that abolitionist um, video, notice how many times the word evil emerges. And related to that, the danger of eternal damnation if you continue to embrace that evil. There's also an undercurrent of enlightenment principles as well. There's the belief in the right of man, the belief in reason, the belief in benevolence. All of these were things that were appealed to by abolitionists. Together, these early abolitionists believed that they could use these things to destroy the slave empire. Close scrutiny of the period immediately following the American Revolution, the days of the early republic, demonstrate the development of these strategies. Paul Cuffe, an African-American businessman, went against the grain a bit um, during this period when he reached the conclusion that the difference between blacks and whites were irreconcilable. Consequently, he felt it was better for them to go someplace else. So during the early days of the Republic, he carries a small group of African Americans to Africa, to Sierra Leone. And here's a question that I want you to consider. Most African Americans didn't embrace colonization. The question to you is why? lived in Africa for a couple hundred years. <laughs> if at all. For many of them, America was their home. They were vested in this country. And I could talk a bit about the African Americans that volunteered to fight in the American Revolution on both sides. Okay. Gabriel a slave in Richmond, Virginia in 1800, concludes that the only way to achieve equality was to destroy slavery. So in 1800, he plans a rebellion that never materializes. The, the, the plan was for the summer of 1800, but the plot was betrayed and the torrential downpour occurred on the day that the rebellion was supposed to take place. Similarly, when we look at other slave rebellions, the Marthese um, in South Carolina concocts this grand conspiracy that never gets off the ground. And then in 1831, Nat Turner leads a rebellion, one that actually materializes, but is ultimately put down. The point I'm trying to make in all of this is that when we look at Garrison and his emphasis on moral suasion, this was a tactic that had a, a history <coughs> already. You have African Americans in Philadelphia that are doing that before Garrison becomes active. The use of violence that was employed by John Brown 
that was something that had been employed as well. Now I want you to understand this, that in many instances progress was made, but in a lot of instances progress was lost. In some instances we ran toward equality. In other instances we stumbled toward it. We last of the abolitionists, at least in my mind. These are the gentlemen who made the transition from high rhetoric, high language, to iron, steel, and fire. These are the gentlemen of the U.S. CT, US, 16th U.S. Colored Troops. And they, some of y'all may know these, these gentlemen. And they usually come to the Promised Land Festival. When is the Promised Land Festival? This year will be uh, May 31st. But all said, um, 180,000, at least 180,000 African Americans fought in the Civil War. But once slavery was abolished, um, the goal of equality still didn't manifest itself. As a matter of fact, I was formally trained as a Civil War Reconstruction historian. Heavy on the Reconstruction side. So the 13th Amendment abolished slavery. The 14th Amendment defined citizenship rights. The 15th Amendment gave African American men the right to vote. In 1875, you have the Civil Rights Act, which bans discrimination in places of public accommodation. But equality is still not much up to me. But that is not to suggest that they didn't continue fighting because a lot of the battles that these abolitionists took up in terms of equality. Be mindful of this, they're, they're fighting for the abolition of slavery, but in the North, they're also fighting for the end of segregation. So the battle takes a new form, but nonetheless, it's still Where is Miss Grimke? Many persons go to the South for a season and are hospitably entertained in the parlor and at the table of the slaveholder. They never enter the huts of the slaves. They know nothing of the dark side of the picture. And they return home with praises on their lips of the generous character of those with whom they had tarried. Or if they had witnessed the cruelties of slavery by remaining silent spectators, they have naturally become callous. And insensibility has ensued, which prepares them to apologize even for barbarity. Yeah, this is Frederick Douglass. I love the pure, peaceable, and the impartial Christianity of Christ. I therefore hate the corrupt, shareholding, women whipping, crazy plundering, parsing and hypocritical Christianity of the land. Indeed, I can see no reason but the most deceitful one for calling the religion of this land Christianity. I look upon it as the climax of all missionaries, the boldest of all frauds, and the grossest of all libels. Of course, in a novel, people's hearts break, and they die, and that is the end of it. And in a story that is very convenient. But in real life, we do not die when all that makes life bright dies to us. William Lloyd Garrison. On this subject, I do not wish to think or speak or write with moderation. No, no. Tell a man whose house is on fire to give a moderate alarm. Tell him to moderately rescue his life from the hands of gravity. Tell the mother to gradually extricate her babe from the fire into which it has fallen. But urge me not to use moderation in a cause like this, like the present. I am in earnest. I will not equivocate, I will not excuse, I will not retreat a single inch, and I will be heard. 
Where's my John Brown? It is deemed necessary that I should forfeit my life for the furtherance of the ends of justice and mingle my blood further with the blood of my children and with the blood of millions in the slave country, whose rights are disregarded by wicked, cruel, and unjust enactments. I submit, so let it be done. The issues that were wrestled with during the abolitionist struggle were things that carried over into what Dr. Bertrand is going to talk about um, um, the next time we meet. As Dr. Williams said, that uh, we'll be having four of, of these discussions starting today. And the next time we meet, I think February 22nd on a Saturday, uh, we'll be talking about uh, the film Slavery uh, under a different name. What I wanted to mention today, and in, in, um, sort of in reference to uh, the abolitionist movement, and to think about um, in many ways how uh, what has made this country great in many ways uh, is basically the principles that were established at its very beginning. Uh, and Dr. Williams indicated. Uh, we may not want to get into uh, the contradictions that the founding fathers themselves uh, had, their own contradictions and, and so forth. Uh, but the principles that they established for this nation very early uh, has been uh, basically something that we have tried to live up to uh, since that very beginning. And it had been a struggle, uh, a struggle to live up to those principles. Uh, and we can Think about all men are created equal in the in the words of the doc of the uh, Declaration of Independence. How that's been expanded, uh, all women uh, and so forth. But uh, all people are created equal. But we have had a struggle in this country's history to basically live up to those principles. And as Dr. Williams said, we have often uh, for equality. We have run toward it. We have stumbled toward it. Oftentimes, it appears that the government, particularly, has run away from it. Uh, and even in, up until today. And if we think about uh, often the people who are most strident in seeking equality and gaining that equality, uh, we think about uh, in terms of labeling people who try to simply live up to those principles as radicals, as some sort of uh, uh, radicals who are outside of the mainstream. And even up until today, if we think about different movements in terms of unions, in terms of protesters, we often see that they have been radicalized, or excuse me, they have been marginalized as radicals. Uh, something is wrong with them. And I often think with, uh, when I was growing up, and I grew up in South Louisiana, I'm a huge New Orleans Saints fan, but I'm from South Louisiana, uh, and I remember going to school and basically being taught that abolitionists were somewhat shaky in terms of who they were. Uh, John Brown, we were taught that John Brown was some kind of nut. Right. right. He was some guy that was just so far out, he was bad. He was bad. But yet, what was he seeking? He was seeking to destroy the system of slavery. And he was doing so through the word of God. That he believed God had put him in that place to do that. But why? Why? And it's not just in the South. I, I've read things with John F. Kennedy growing up, and he was taught the same thing in Massachusetts, that people like John Brown were evil, they were bad, they were really bad. Why is that? Why do we marginalize in this country? Why do we marginalize those people who are simply seeking to make this country live up to the principles upon which it was founded? It's an issue that doesn't just live in the past. That just doesn't live, you know, back in the 1860s, 1840s, 1850s. It lives today. We have people who are protesting today. We have people who are in unions who basically are shouted down wherever they go. We have people who actually get up on in the newspaper in the Tennessee and who basically shout down in print the president of Tennessee State University because she speaks the truth. Right? Why? Why is it? Why why do people, you know, are we moderates? We just want to basically say, well, let's just let it go the way it is and we'll just be happy with it. I don't know. 